Well, as we jump into today's text, I've been thinking a lot about a very simple word, the word great. It's about as simple as can get. It's one syllable. It has two vowels, three consonants for a total of five letters. But the unique thing about the word great is it can have different meanings based off of how it's said. For example, let's assume I walk in the front door this afternoon when I get home. And as I walk in the door, my wife says, oh, by the way, Peyton got a new dog. Now, I can look at her and I can say, great. And we all know that I'm upset. Or I can say, great. Same word, and now we know I'm excited. Or I can say, great. And now I'm confused. So such a simple word, like many of our words, it's not about the word itself. It's about the heart behind how it's said. There's a local, in, not a local insurance company, but a national insurance company that has been really capitalizing on the play on words of how you can say the same thing and have different meanings. And so just to draw the point, let's watch this fun little commercial. Is this my car? State Farm knows that for every one of what? those moments, this is ridiculous. There's one of these. Is this my car? What? This is ridiculous. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. Oh, it's happening, sweetheart. Oh, it's happening, sweetheart. Shut up. Shut up. Ah! <laughs> That's why State Farm is there. What a day. With car insurance for when things go wrong. What a day. But also here with car. <laughs> it's a great example. It's not always about what is said, but the heart behind what is said. And so as we get into today's text in Mark chapter 12, we'll be picking up at verse 13. We're going to see three different types of questions. And the thing that we need to pay attention to is not so much the question, but the heart behind the question. And so if you remember the context as we get into this, we've, we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks. Jesus has been traveling the country. And he's teaching his word. And as he's teaching, the Pharisees and all these different leaders, community leaders, have lined up like rabid reporters looking for an opportunity to catch him on his words and to make him look foolish and incriminate him. And so at this text, verse 13, we see that two more groups have come together to talk to, to, talk to Jesus, to question him and try to challenge him. So Mark chapter 12, verse 13. So later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin, and he asked them, whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Now, isn't it timely that two days before an election, we're talking about taxes? <laughs> Don't worry, you're going to be okay. So, let's think more about the context here. You have these two groups that have formed really an unholy alliance, because these two groups absolutely hated each other. You had the Pharisees who, if, if we brought them into modern day era, we would call them, oh, the, uh, the right-wing religionists. Okay? They felt like anything that we did with Rome or the people did with Rome was a compromise and was against what God wanted. And so they were the ultra, ultra conservative, hated the, the leaders of the time, hated Rome. And then you have the Herodians who if we brought them into modern times, we'd call them the expedient liberals that had learned that there was much to be gained if you aligned with Rome. So these two groups hated each other. I mean, they hated each other more than Republicans and Democrats two days before a presidential election. <laughs> it was a fierce hate. So all of a sudden, these guys have come together in this unholy alliance. And why? Well, apparently they'd heard the old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so they've teamed up to take out Jesus. And they bring to him what really seems like an impossible question. Because no matter how Jesus answers, so they think, they can incriminate him. If Jesus says, yes, pay the tax, then the Pharisees will say, you're aligning with Rome. 
and therefore you are not of God and we and, and can incriminate him that way. If he says, don't pay the tax, then the Herodians, they can call down the wrath of Rome on him. So it's a lose-lose. And these guys know it. And so what does Jesus do? Instead of answering directly, he takes a step back and he puts it back on them. And I love them. He says, get me a coin. Do you have a coin? And I imagine that it didn't take them long for the, the Pharisees, it, it could have been the Herodians, to pull a coin out of their pocket. And the moment they did that, if it was the Pharisees, they had already played their cards and they had already lost the argument. Because as he, they take a look, if you are using Caesar's money, which the Pharisees, everybody was using, if you're using Caesar's money, then in some way or fashion, you have already submitted to Caesar. And so he made them look foolish from the get-go. So he pulls it out, and then he says, on the coin, he says, whose image is on that? Now, that's unique for that culture. Because just like for you and I, if I say the word cross, you might picture the big wooden cross on the wall, but you're also, your mind is going to make the leap, and you're going to think about Jesus and the crucifixion. Because we've ingrained that into our culture. Likewise, with this culture, when they talked about an image then they immediately would think of Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, where it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So they're going to be thinking, I was created in God's image. They're also going to be thinking, we're not supposed to create an image of anything else because that would be an idol. So this context, so Jesus takes it, he puts it back on them. He says, whose image is on it? Caesar's, they answer. And he says, well, then logic follows. If Caesar's image is on it, then it originated with Caesar, and therefore give it back to Caesar. Likewise, and then he takes them the next step. He says, it's not about taxes. It's about the heart. But you guys, you were created in God's image, and give yourself back to God. And so they, here they come in with a scheming question of about taxes, thinking they're going to condemn him. And he answers, it's not about your question. It's about the fact that you are trying to incriminate me and your heart is wrong and you need to get right with God. That's how he handles the scheming question. I wonder for you and I, if we really believed to our core that we were created in the image of God, would it change how we go about our daily life? Would it change when I leave here and I'm in a restaurant and my server spills coffee on me? Would it change if when she looks at me, I'm thinking she's seeing a picture of God? Would it change how I respond to her and the forgiveness that I grant her? When I see someone who in life has crashed and burned because of bad choices they've made, would it change if I believe when they look at me that they're seeing the image, the picture of God who offers forgiveness and redemption? Would it change how I respond to them and whether or not I condemn them or whether I attempt to help them? And so he's saying, look, it's not about the taxes. It's about the heart. And it's about not coming with a scheming question but aligning with God. So these guys step aside. Okay, okay well, that didn't work. Next up, we have the Sadducees who step up. Picking up in verse 18. And then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow. He also died, leaving no children. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they will be like the angels in heaven. Now, about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Now, I don't know about you. When I read this text, the first thing I, I think is, brother number three, hightail it, get out of town. We have a black widow here. Somebody call CSI. <laughs> right? 
I mean, fourth brother, are you really going to marry this woman? Get out of there. She's probably poisoning him. I don't know what's going on. But they come up with this ridiculous story trying to catch him and because it wasn't about marriage. They wanted to demonstrate that they thought they'd come up with a way to prove there was no resurrection. So these guys, they, the Sadducees, they really believed that the first five books of the Bible were the holy ones. Everything else was like second tier compared to that. And so since they didn't perceive mention of the resurrection in those first five books, they said it must not be true. It must not be so. And so they're trying to catch him. So they concoct this absolutely ridiculous scenario that would never really happen. And they, they take it to Jesus. Well, he throws it back at them. He answers them from the books that they believe in. And he quotes back to them Exodus 3.15. Where he says, God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. So as they're scheming and trying to say there's no resurrection, oh, you know what, a quick side note on marriage, because I'm sure a couple of wives out there are probably perked up when you hear that there's no marriage in heaven. I, I remember when I first mentioned that to my wife a couple months after being married, it did not go over well. Okay, guys, guys, this is not a point you want to drive when you're having a fight, all right? No, so we could do a whole sermon. We could probably do a series on this. But to overly simplify what I personally believe, why there is not marriage in heaven, is that in heaven, our relationships with one another are going to be so pure that there's no need for this sort of a covenant promise. That's why I believe there's no need for, that, for marriage in heaven. It doesn't mean I won't spend eternity with my wife. In fact, I tease her about being eternally bound to me. Poor thing. Anyway, where are we? So going back to this. So Jesus answers, and I love that how he answers is he begins answering the question by the character of God. He says, God is the God of the living, not the dead. And if God is the God of the living, not the dead, then there's a couple, two, a couple things that we can assume. Number one, that God is alive. How many of you believe that? A few of you. Well, good. We're off to a good start. <laughs> okay? God is alive. And for him to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, now, then that, that assumes that they have to be alive somewhere as well. Because he's the God of the living, not of the dead. And so where are they alive? They're alive with him in eternity. And so the resurrection is based on the character of God being the God of the living. These guys didn't get it. But for, for us, though, if we follow Jesus' example, then the example here is that when we are faced with tough questions in life, should I pursue this work path? How do I handle this crisis in my life? How do I treat this person over here? Where we should always start attempting to answer that is with the character of God. And his scripture is built on his character. And it will give us guidance. Well, all these, this, these two scheming questions really draws out one specific thing. That we need to beware of the deceitfulness of the heart. And the temptation to ask questions intent on justifying our own sinful desires. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Well, what do you mean my, the heart is deceitful? Well, our heart, you know, people always say, follow your heart. No, don't follow your heart. Follow God's word. Because the heart will take you down fast. Let's take, for example, sex outside of marriage. If you read the scriptures, you know it says, hey, don't have sex outside of marriage. But how many Single people have I worked with over the years that have said, well, technically we're not having sex. Oh, really? Technically. Okay, so technically, so that means you're doing all kinds of other messing around and you're not living the whole idea of, of being above reproach and being pure? I mean, that's kind of like when I take my kids into Diamond, there's something magical about Diamond Home Improvement. My children are good kids, but when I walk into that store, I always have to stop because they have more problems in that store than any other store. And I always stop. Maybe I go in there too much. Huh. Anyway, I, I always stop and I, I, before we walk in, I say, okay, 
I wish I could just say, be on your best behavior. But that doesn't work. Instead, I have to say, okay, no fighting, no pushing, no arguing, no roughhousing, you know, no kicking, no biting, no spitting. Got it? Okay, and we walk in, and we're in there two minutes, and someone hits someone. I'm like, what did I say? Well, you didn't say no hitting. <laughs> really? Did you get the point? We do that with God's word. We, we think that may, because it's not spelled out every single detail that we can justify some of the things we do. Saying, no. Go with the point, and we know the point. Don't let your heart deceive you. We do this on all kinds of things. Sometimes we use God's word to get away with like a white lie. Let's take, for example, if if I were to ask my wife, hey, honey, I've been gaining weight lately. Is it noticeable? It It feels like everybody can see. And she knows that scripture talks about, you know, only saying that is wor- which is worthy of lifting people up. And so she says, no, honey, you can't tell. Are you kidding me? It looks like I'm pregnant. <laughs> right? But she doesn't want to hurt my feelings. And so she says, no, honey, you're okay. Well, maybe what she should say, and now my wife actually is brutally honest with me, but maybe what she should say is, hey, lay off the junk food. Lay off the Dutch brothers. Get out there and start exercising, bud, because, yeah, it's not looking that good. <laughs> All right? We, we need to make sure that we don't take Scripture and just, just pounce on one little piece of it that we want to use for our own purposes. And that's what these guys were doing. They were taking Scripture, distorting it, in order to try to trick and trap Jesus. And he says, look, if you're going to distort my word, if you're going to scheme, then your heart is off. Get right with me. That's the takeaway from these two. So they move on. We now have a guy who approaches And he's a scribe, and he comes with a seeking question. If you look throughout the other accounts of the Gospels, you'll see that some of them say that, you know, he was probably in line with one of those uh, trapping questions. But by this point, he actually comes forward with a legitimate question. And so let's pick up in verse 28 and see what he has to say. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and, with all, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. So this guy comes with a seeking question, and it's a legitimate question. Remember, the scribes, they would spend all day long copying down God's word. And as they did that, they discovered there are 613 commands that had been laid out for the Jewish people. And so out of these 613, which is the most important? And the religious leaders of those times, they had a way of ranking them where they would say the most important is this and the least important is this. And it's a valid thing because what is more important, to love God or not murder? Sounds pretty important to me, both of those. Well, what's more important, to keep the Sabbath or not use the Lord's name in vain? And so they would rank these with a legitimate conversation But that would also, all the things that they put lower ranking, they would kind of let themselves off the hook on that. And they would put taking care of others and loving other people down low and let themselves off the hook. And Jesus says, no, 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 we're not not going to do that. And he takes those 613 commands and he wraps them into two that I believe are inseparable, are one and the same. Love God, love people. He says, all those other things are wrapped up into that. And I like the guy's response because he then says, hey, you're right in saying that the Lord is one. By the way, did you notice again Jesus answered the question based off of the character of God? The Lord God is one God. He's full. He's complete. And so this guy says, you're right. God is one God. He's a a full, complete God. And all of this stuff is summed up into these two things. And he says, so much so that it's greater than any burnt offering. Remember, Thousands upon thousands of animals were sacrificed every single year as people came and said, I'm sorry, God, that I offended you. I know the penalty is bloodshed, and here's my animal to pay the price. And this guy says, look, loving God and loving people is more important than all those. 
Apparently, he had not heard what we like to do nowadays where we say it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And he says, no, it's better not to offend God than to have to do these sacrifices. If we love God and love people, we won't offend him, and we won't have to do all these, these sacrifices. That's his point here. So let's take a quick moment and hold on to your seatbelts there because we're going to fly through these next couple things. How do we love God, and how do we love people? A couple examples. There's, there's so many things that we could talk about. I'm only highlighting a few, so don't think this is all comprehensive here. First of all, obedience. John 14, 15 tells us, if you love me, obey my commands. That's the do's and the don'ts. Obedience. Second, we live for him. Colossians 3, 17 says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, in whatever you do, in word or deed, that's both in public and in private. Haven't we seen that with this election? The importance of being the same person in public as you are in private? Jesus says, you don't get to pick and choose. You be my servant, no matter where you're at. And you love and live for him. As referenced in verse 31, we love one another. And so how do we love people? Examples that seem to be on my mind this time of year. Number one is we live in harmony. As we're told in Romans chapter 12, verse 16, to live in harmony with one another. At election season, it is so easy to fight with people. So easy. And it is so much more difficult to actually sit down and dialogue with people about productive things, even when you disagree. And I think that as we go out and as we engage, you know, with, with whether it's on Facebook, please be the same person on Facebook as you are before God always, okay? Whether it's on Facebook, whether it's out in the community, that whether you agree or disagree with somebody, whether you agree or disagree on the local level election things, the national things, the presidential, whether you agree or disagree, as believers in Christ, we can do that in harmony. And we can dialogue with people respectfully, and we can still let the love of Jesus flow through us when we disagree with someone else's point of view. And I believe that's the attitude we need to be taking into the next couple days. We also listen. That's how we love people. James 1.19 says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. If you think back to your childhood, I wonder if you can remember, because I can the very first time that you felt like somebody was really, really listening to you, that they really wanted to know what you had to say. I have good parents. They did pay attention. But one time stands out above all else. I was seven or eight years old. I, we were visiting this family, the Archers in, California, or actually in Florida. sorry. And I remember sitting down with Mrs. Archer, and I have no idea what story I was telling her. But I can remember the look on her face. She asked me a question, and I dove into some story about something. And she just sat there completely gazing into my eyes, listening to every single word, hanging on everything that I said. And it changed how I felt for days. I'll bet you when all of a sudden done, she could have recounted my story with greater detail than I gave it. When we listen to people, we show that we value them. That's how we love people. And we forgive. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. It's not easy to forgive people. And remember that forgiveness has nothing to do with whether or not they deserve it. It has to do with passing the love of God through you to someone else. We cannot fully and completely love God unless we love people. Our love for people is evidence that we love God. So I've been trying to think of an example of, uh, to demonstrate how inseparable these two things are, the idea of loving people people and loving others. For some reason, an egg came to mind. So here I am with an egg. But let's just imagine that my friend Brian here says, Dwayne, can I borrow an egg or have an egg? Dwayne, can I borrow an egg? Sure, Brian. Thanks for asking. And so he asked for an egg, and I say, yeah, give, give me just a second. I go over here, and I take this egg. And I say, here you go. Here's an eggshell for you. <laughs> like, that's absolutely ridiculous, right? Did he ask me for an eggshell? No, he asked me for an egg. So when he asked for an egg, he wants the whole egg, the full egg, all of the egg. That's what he asked for. He didn't say, give me an eggshell. He didn't ask for an egg yolk or an egg white. He wants the whole thing complete and full so he can go make some brownies or something. Who knows what he's going to do with it, but he wants the whole thing. 
And as ridiculous as it is for us to think that when he asked for an egg, that I would just give him an eggshell, it's just as ridiculous for us to think that we can love God without loving people. The command is one and the same. We cannot love God to our fullest extent if we don't love people. And that's why Jesus wraps up all those in to that one command. Love God, love people. Well, so at this point, he silenced everyone. And he tells them to, so everybody gets back and he says, okay, well, your scheming questions, when they asked the scheming questions, he said, give yourself back to God. When they asked the seeking questions, he says, give yourself fully, completely to God by loving God and loving people. And then Jesus says, now it's my turn. Now it's my turn to ask a question. And he asked them what I believe is the saving question. He asked them, who is the Messiah? Let's pick up in verse 35. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, why did the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put my enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he, he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. Now, this might sound a little confusing if you don't know the context. And remember, in this culture, they believed that the father always demanded or deserved more honor than the son. And likewise, so did ancestors. And so if you had an ancestor who was great, then that's that much more honor and respect that they're due, that much greater that they are than you. And so we know that King David being a great king, everybody knew King David was a great king. So if Jesus is his descendant, the Messiah is his descendant as his son, he should be lower on the totem pole of respect and honor than King David. And he says, if that's the case, then how can the son, the descendant, be called Lord by King David? He says, that doesn't make any sense. How can he be called Lord if he's his son? And he stops right there. He steps back. And he lets the people just chew on it and dwell on it. I believe the answer is because Jesus was so much more than a great human. So much more than a great man. He is the savior of humanity. And he's the king of kings who left his throne, came down to earth to serve you and I, gave his life and died for our wrongdoings. And then out of that to prove that he had the power to grant you and I forgiveness, the power over death, he rose from the dead that we can spend eternity with him if we put our faith in him. That's what Jesus did. That kind of love, a king who would give his life for you and I, that kind of love is completely worthy of our full submission and allegiance. That's what this entire passage is about. They came asking, who should we pay allegiance to? Rome? The Pharisees? The scriptures, and he says, you pay your allegiance to Jesus Christ, to God on high. This next week, we will, you know, we'll have all sorts of fights up until about 8 p.m. on Tuesday. Half the country will, you know, cry themselves to sleep. Half the country will rejoice. Whether it's a local issue or an international issue, the nice thing is that come Wednesday, historically what we do is we start putting our ourselves back together and we try to unite and we'll see as people stand up and they say the pledge of allegiance and as we approach veterans day and we honor those who have served our nation across the nation people are going to stand up and say the pledge of allegiance something i say with pride and i love doing i hope you do as well but i would encourage you a challenge for you not in any sort of diminishing the importance of that pledge but when you pledge of allegiance, I would encourage you to take a moment and remember who is it that is worthy of our absolute, total, utmost allegiance for every minute of our life. It's Jesus Christ. And I hope that as you make pledges, worthy pledges to our nation, that you never forget who our complete and eternal allegiance is to. That's Jesus. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you so much that despite what's, what's going on in our culture, you're still there, that you're in control, and that we can count on you. Lord, help us know what it means to live for you and to uh, pledge our allegiance to you day in and day out. Help us to represent you in all aspects of our life. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.